This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Recently, uh, my conservative colleague, MP Hoback, introduced Bill C-379, which would implement tougher penalties for repeat car thieves across Canada by bringing in a mandatory minimum of three years in jail for those who have stolen a motor vehicle three times. Do you think this legislation, if implemented, would assist your officers in putting and keeping repeat car thieves behind bars? I guess I'll answer that first, if, if you don't mind, Nick. Um, I can tell you from our experience here in Toronto, as well as the, the, uh, the statistics coming out of Provincial Carjacking Task Force, almost 50% of those involved that we've uh, apprehended are repeat offenders. And of that, about a third are young offenders. And so clearly there, there is an issue with, um, um, you know, with, with, with folks being charged and arrested again and again for the same offenses. So I think that, uh, um, from my opinion, that would help. That will maybe um, just just echo that. I do believe that consideration to uh, legislative changes, such as how often a person is able to commit an offense, will make a difference. I do think that we need to be considerate about how we apply that. But the reality is, is a large percentage of our carjackings are committed by people who already have previous existing uh, violent criminal records. And that's definitely something that identifies itself as an opportunity to begin addressing. Thank you for that. This question will be for Mr. Weber. Mr. Weber, last week you stated that the $60 million that was used for the Arrive Can app could have been used to hire 600 border agents. Meanwhile, we know that over the last eight years, the current government has only added approximately 25 frontline officers to the CBSA. Can you speak to what kind of message this sends to your hardworking CBSA officers when the government is willing to squander $60 million on an app while we currently have a shortage of border agents? Thank you for the question. I think it sends a very negative message. Uh, what we're seeing overall is an over-reliance on technologies. Like you mentioned, ArriveCan. We have pick machines at airports. There's other technologies whose focus seems to be rather than helping officers interdict, uh, replacing officers and automating our border. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd go back to uh, Deputy Chief Johnson. Um, Deputy Chief Johnson, in your opening remarks, um, you mentioned um, a spike in, in auto thefts over the last few years and an epidemic in this country, some of your words. You mentioned there was 1,300 offenders. Uh, I'm not sure if it was yourself or the other chief mentioned about repeat offenders. Could you just mention what's really driving this? Why is it increasing so much? Yeah, so that's, that was since 2018, 1,300 offenders and over 5,000 charges. Again, to your previous question and, and to uh, Deputy Chief uh, Milinovic's comments around, uh, you know, folks that get involved in uh, this, these type of offenses are, uh, you know, like I said earlier, almost 50% are repeat offenders. Um, sometimes uh, specifically with, with um, car theft or carjacking, but also other violent offenses. And so, you know, we are seeing that, uh, that demographic. And as I also mentioned, about a third of that 50% uh, our repeat young offenders. Thank you. And you mentioned that we really need to return, your quote exactly, a return to a sense of safety in communities. Do you feel if we get some of these repeat offenders off the roads or off the streets, we would get back to a sense of safety in our communities? Well, that's one component. Yes, there are some uh, other strategies I think we should look at those that have been mentioned already this afternoon. Thank you. And Deputy Chief Milanovic, you mentioned in your opening remarks too that and I'll quote you, you said we need tougher sanctions. Would you like to expand on what you exactly mean by tougher sanctions? Yeah, I believe we need to consider what is available to us in terms of enforcement and the legislation. Um, you know, generally speaking, you're going to find people that are charged with possession of stolen property over 5,000, theft over 5,000. These are the most common charges in auto theft, but they don't reflect uh, the risk and the injury that it's causing to our community. So what I would advocate for, and in conversations with crowns, um, you know, we always hear there should be federal legislation very similar to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which takes some of those same concepts and legislates them, again, very similar to the way that we do with illegal drugs. The importation, exportation of stolen property or stolen autos, if federally legislated, would then have that jurisdiction attached to it, and it would make it easier for the police sector to pursue and investigate that 
and really pursue the people responsible for it, which is the organized crime element behind and that is benefiting from this issue. Thank you to the two deputies. Back to Mr. Weber. Mr. Weber, at a recent committee appearance, you mentioned that as of 2019, only one millionth of all rail cargo was effectively being examined by the CBSA and that your operational abilities in the rail field are virtually non-existent. Can you discuss how this lack of operational abilities impacts our ability to address the auto theft crisis? Thank you. It affects it greatly. I mean, you don't know what you're not catching when you don't look. We effectively don't look at rail at all. So if you're asking me to tell you exactly how much is coming in, uh, we really don't know because it's not a mode that we're looking into. Uh, when we're looking at exports, for example, at the Port of Montreal, again, uh, same kind of situation. It's a very small percentage that we could actually look at. Do you know or have a sense of the difference between the number of those autos that were stolen are exported compared to the number that are revinned or chop shop? for parts. So we do keep those statistics. Um, I don't have them with me, but we, we do have that. Okay. And I, you know, without getting into the exact, like I could absolutely approximate, we expect about 60% is being stolen for export and 40% uh, either, you know, whether it be revend or moved around the country or resold under some other nefarious activity, but large percentage for export. All right, thank you. And I, so, I suspect Toronto would be very similar to those numbers. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Weber, you made a comment early on about the disconnect between the upper echelon of CBSA and the boots on the ground. So uh, it's not the first time I've heard that about CBSA. So what is that issue and how do you fix it from your perspective? Uh, I think the people who work the front line need to be consulted. I think the CBSA should look at promoting from within so you get people in positions where they can make decisions on how the border runs who've actually worked at a border previously. That's currently not the case at the CBSA for as long as I've been around. My career started in 2002 with the agency. It's been a long time that we've been operating like that. And as I meet um, representatives from other police agencies, uh, other unions, it seems to be uh, uniquely a CBSA problem. As a rule, people in positions of of authority who are decision makers uh, in other agencies have worked the front line, have made it up through the ranks. We simply don't do that at the CBSA. Okay, I, I was naive because I actually thought that that was, uh, you know, succession planning is a role that uh, police agencies employ and works well, generally. That doesn't happen in the CBSA. Like, the people that are in leadership positions now basically don't have a clue about how, how things work on the ground. I mean, don't have a clue might be a bit harsh in some cases, no, but when I'm we're talking direct most times, when we're talking uh, making policy upper levels of CBSA management, no, they don't come from the front line. It's generally lower level, mid level managers who come from the front line. That's unfortunate, and I would say there's a fix right there. So it's a change in it's a change in uh, I guess uh, you know your own policies internally. So thank you for that. Um, to the deputies, I know from experience that early in your training, we learned about prevention but the importance of crime prevention. And um, I haven't been on public safety as long as Mr. Gerritsen, but over the course of, of uh, a number of years, I have sat on this committee. And we did a study some years back, uh, and uh, street checks or what you would call in Ontario carding. We call them street checks out west. Um, it was a big deal. And it, 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 was, uh, it was something that was being removed from the opportunity for police on the ground to prevent crime. To, to have an opportunity to, um, to um, determine identities of individuals who are involved in crime. Um, we use them uh, very effectively, and I think uh, other agencies have as well. So you talk about the things that police agencies can do or should do to make a difference on prevention. Um, would, would, would something along those lines, like what, what, you, we talk about what tools could assist you in, in, uh, in policing besides uh, more money and more bodies, that's always a, a necessary tool. What do you think are tools that could help in the prevention of, after they've been stolen uh, in the justice system, we talk about all those things that can be fixed and should be fixed, um, legislation changes. How do we prevent them from occurring in the first place if, you, if you're just looking at it from a policing perspective and not from manufacturers or not from consumers? Yeah, and maybe I'll uh, jump in quickly and then uh, uh, Deputy Johnson can add, but um, prevention, absolutely. It's crucial and critical to what we do. And, 
you know, I, I see policing, the policing opportunity from a prevention perspective is to build awareness. You know, last year, uh, the GTA services and, and Peel, we held the first auto summit uh, for the GTA to discuss the issue. And then on the heels of that, really began to promote and share the story with the community. And, you know, fast forward a little, a little less than a year uh, later, here we are having this conversation on a national level. So, you know, the awareness piece is crucial. And what that has created for us is the consumers looking at the vehicle differently. They're not just asking about comfort, about performance statistics, but they're asking about security uh, possibilities, like what that vehicle uh, can do to prevent itself from being stolen. The reality is it's the second largest purchase that a person is going to make in their life aside from a house. And, you know, people are really, really aware, particularly here in the GTA, that those vehicles and those investments are at risk. So they're engaging all different types of things and the awareness is there. And I think that's crucial to, to how we prevent the cars from being stolen is through con consumer Thank you, Mr. Action. Motz. We'll move.